Hello, this is Gary Pinnell, <clears throat> and I'd like to welcome you to our Bible study today. We will be in James chapter 1, but if you're reading through the Bible with us, then you would also be looking at me, Micah chapter Micah chapter 2, Psalm 119, 137 to 144, James chapter 1, and Joel chapter 2. So let's go ahead and keep that in mind. Now, as we start the book of James, James is the half-brother of Jesus. So he grew up in the family with Jesus along as also Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. There were other boys. I think there were four altogether. And there were at least two girls in Jesus' family. Uh, so as the Catholic Church, a Roman Catholic Church, ties, tries to say that um, these were children that Joseph had before he married Mary. Uh, but no, Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus. But then she went on to have a normal family. She had, uh, so as I said, I believe it was four boys. And, um, and you can check that out because it lists the names and so on uh, in the Gospels. But also at least two girls because it said, and his sisters. So that would be plural. But uh, James is called the Proverbs of the New Testament because of the way that he writes. And I think it is very interesting because being a half-brother of Jesus, so, she, so he grew up with Jesus, James did, and he would know what Jesus was really like. <clears throat> and then also, but we know that they did not receive the Lord uh, they themselves, even being in the family with Jesus, being Jesus being perfect in every way, um, they still did not accept him as who he said that he was, the Messiah, until after the resurrection of Christ. But can you imagine the salvation experience that James had when he realized that his half-brother was really the Messiah? And so we, we see that, and I just think it's really, really interesting the way that he writes. And I think we need to be uh, really into uh, thinking about how Jesus is a half-brother of James who's writing this book. Now, James went on to become basically one of the main leaders in the Jerusalem church there. And so he's going to say something really interesting in the first few verses. Let's look at that. <clears throat> says, James, a servant of God. So he doesn't say the half-brother of Jesus or <laughs> anything like that, but just a servant of God, a humble servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he didn't say my brother, or half brother, anything like that. He just uh, he's just another person, as far as uh, he is concerned, uh, that <clears throat> received Jesus as his savior. Then he says to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. The twelve tribes in the dispersion. What would that mean? Well, dispersion in the past would be where the Jewish people were scattered into different parts of the world. But here he's talking about the Jewish people that have been saved, those that are born again. And they have been scattered because uh, he's still in Jerusalem, it seems, and waited to the last minute before, actually, uh, in 70 AD, uh, the 
the Romans came and of course besieged Jerusalem and um, then struck the people there, killed over two million people, uh, men, women, and children. But before that, the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the Jews caused the Christians to scatter, to scatter into many parts of the world by their persecution. Now at the time, I'm sure the Christians felt well, that's, you know, we have to leave our home and we have to, you know what? That was the best thing that could have happened to them. God was looking out for the Christians, those that had received the Lord, because they were protected by leaving Jerusalem. Otherwise, they probably would have been killed along with the others. So many of the Christians were still allowed to leave and protected by God because they scattered uh, with protection. Uh, with the persecution that was taking place in Jerusalem. So that's who James now is going to address. Those that were with him before and he was leader over, now he wants to address them with this letter that God has given him to share with them. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, James is reminding them, wherever they are, scattered as persecuted Christians, uh, that are, a lot of these would be Jewish uh, Christians, because that's who he mainly worked with, and the other apostles, uh, Peter and some of the others, but James especially, uh, was working, he was working with Christians, that had been Jews, but they received the Lord. And so they're in the, the body of Christ now. And they have been scattered out from Jerusalem into different parts of Israel, but also into different parts of the world. And he tells them, listen, be steadfast in the Lord. Don't give up. Uh, these trials that you're having, uh, just like uh, we know that in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, it says, For we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Everything that comes into our life has a purpose. It has a meaning. It has a reason. And so um, we thank the Lord for it. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but you probably noticed that I have a, a black eye, basically, uh, right now. As so I'm giving this, um, I was hit by a, a dolly uh, moving a, a hundred pounds of uh, sand when I dropped it onto the dolly. It wasn't there level, and it came back and whacked me in the face, and. Uh, was I'm glad that that it wasn't worse than what it was, and you know that everything, even that, uh, we I have to look at it in the light that all things, even what we think of as accidents, all means all, and that's all that all means. That there's a purpose for it. And I don't know the purpose right now, but I do know that God is faithful. And then the other thing is that our car stopped working yesterday. I mean, just stopped working and we have a nice Prius but it's uh, got like 240 some thousand miles on it but we're driving and going to church and all of a sudden the sign comes up your um, car it, it says that um, the, they're a hybrid and so it said uh, it means both they use gas and and um, electricity but it says your 
hybrid system has failed and uh, find move, uh, move to the side of the road safely as quickly as you can. Something to that effect. Well, fortunately, we were just down on the last little hill going into Sela, uh, Calvary Sela, where we go to church. And the Lord protected us in the sense that we were able to get off the road and just drive right into the parking lot at the church. And then the, the smoke was coming out of the engine and so on. And we still haven't found out exactly what's wrong. But I really believe, and God has given me peace, that even though that's the only car we have and so on, the Lord is going to take care of us. But already things have happened. Uh, there was a car that pulled off behind us and people that didn't even know us and offered to help. And I was able to give them, because I have, I'm a Gideon and we give out New Testaments. I was able to give one uh, a Spanish testimony, testament between them and two English Testaments. And they took those and were very grateful. And so that maybe it just uh, that happens, if nothing else, to see those people saved. But uh, we've got to be careful not to... Uh, think well, I know we use the word accidents and and the, so on, but with God there's no accidents. Everything that happens, and so we need to move on. But I was just going to share that with you, and thank you for your prayers. <clears throat> then it says, "Okay, because God wants us to mature to become complete." Uh, and perfect means mature, all right? And so we see that. And then as we look on into the following verses, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. <clears throat> Still fighting this cold, and uh, thank you for your prayers for that too. Now, if anyone lacks wisdom, boy, boy, do I lack wisdom. Lots of times I pray for this. Well, I think for many years, I, after a Christian, I didn't even realize that you could do that. <laughs> and then I came across this verse and understood what God is saying. Now, Paul, I mean, Paul, uh, Solomon, uh, he asked God for wisdom. And God did give him wisdom. He was the smartest man in the world, the Bible says. That's, of course, uh, besides Jesus. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, but God liked it that he asked for wisdom to lead his people correctly. So he did a good job on that until... Um, he fell into sin by disobeying God and taking uh, many wives from different nations and so on, which uh, that they were <clears throat> allowed to have more than one wife in the Old Testament, but it was never God's perfect will. And I believe he sinned by doing that. But also Solomon, he got away from the Lord and the book of James, or the book of um, in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastics, where we're reading and corresponding Proverbs that he wrote, um, but Ecclesiastes especially is his testimony of how he lived in the world for a while, and then he got right with God toward the end of his life, and so he wants to tell what life was like uh, living as if uh, God is, didn't really exist, but it, under the sun. So, but he did ask God for wisdom to lead the nation of Israel correctly. And he did a good job other than uh, sinning with uh, marrying these other women. But outside of that, Lord gave him wisdom and he did come back at the end of his life and got right with the Lord. So, but two, we can ask for wisdom. And God says we can. And so I do ask for wisdom. And I believe the Lord, in every given situation, we should ask him for wisdom, and he will help us in our life. 
we're going to have to move along here more quickly because of our time that is going so fast. Um, so, but let him ask in faith. So you have to have faith. Without faith, it says it's impossible to please God. And that's what in Hebrews it says that. <coughs> Excuse me. Which we have already covered. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. <clears throat> For the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. All right. Again, this is something, not only do we need to ask for wisdom, but we need to ask for faith, but to live in faith. We have faith. It's just a matter of using the faith that God has given us. I mean, look at the faith that evolutionists, evolutionists, I said we want to call it, evolutionists have in the uh, way they pronounce it in England. I like the pronunciation, evolution, because that's what it is, is. And they've used it to lead people away from the Lord. But in, uh, people have faith to believe that everything is one big accident, including the universe and everything in it. That's evolution, all right? They have faith to do that. Well, why can't we use our faith and to please God and to believe him for great things. And so that's what we need to do. And it says without faith in Hebrews, it is impossible to please God. So I want to please God, don't you? And so we're going to live for the Lord and not be double-minded. Oh, I don't know if God is helping me or not, or if he's there or not. No, just walk forward in faith. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation <clears throat> because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower, flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So, <laughs> we need to understand our life is very short. But whether we're rich or poor, doesn't matter. If we're poor, we uh, exalt in, like Paul said, I know how to be uh, rich and poor, how to be abased and how to abound, how to be hungry, how to be uh, filled, uh, whatever state that we're in. We just need to trust the Lord. And uh, this is something that uh, poor people have over rich people. They can live by faith and trust God for everything, whereas the rich kind of trust in themselves for what they have. And sometimes they are the hardest to reach for the Lord. So let's realize that everything that we have is from the Lord. Our life and our breath is also from him, and it is very short. It's like the grass of the field that is there, and then it's cut, and then it's gone. It's like the flower that starts, it blooms, and then it uh, starts to fade. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast. Hello, Kiran. Under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. 
and the sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Okay, first he talks about two different things. One is trials, and those are things, problems. Paul said that on the way to heaven, we're going to go through many trials. And um, everybody has those, even the unsaved have those. And uh, even up to death, uh, the unsaved die in car accidents and different things, maybe unexpected death and so on. Uh, but trials, and so that's to be expected. But then also, w there are temptations, and that's different. Temptations come, well, uh, they can come from the devil, but a lot of times they come from our old nature, our nature that is not uh, really living uh, for the Lord. We have that old nature, and where is it considered that it is dead? Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And so that's the way we're to live. But a lot of times we're tempted like Eve was. We look at things that we shouldn't be looking at. We uh, have pride in our lives. And I would say, I need to say this, and as I said that, the Lord reminded me when we say, look at things that we should, and I was thinking of envy and wanting what other people have, but I will also include in that the temptations to look at pornography, all right? There's just something about our human flesh that wants to look at things that we should not look at, and I like how Job said that I have made a covenant with my eye that I will not look at a, a maiden to lust after her, and so uh, and, of course, the same applies to a woman as well. But then the temptation that comes, it's not from God. God does not send us temptation. Uh, God may allow us to be tempted in this world, but he does not send temptation. That comes from the devil. That comes from our old nature. And we need to get victory over that and ask the Lord to strengthen us and to uh, not be led away by the temptations of our flesh or from the devil. All right, so then um, the, that when those sins and thoughts are planted, uh, if we don't get victory over it, it can bring death, even uh, early death for Christians. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his uh, creatures. Okay. So we want to be realizing that he has saved us and that we are his first fruits. Uh, that Christ uh, was rose from the dead and uh, we are like him in the sense that we will be raised from the dead uh, as Christians. And so we want to worship and praise him for all the good things that he gives us every day and not to be ungrateful. Okay, then it says, know this, my brothered, uh, beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. All right, first of all, the uh, salvation comes from the word of God. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Paul told uh, Timothy that you were able to receive the Lord because your heart was prepared when your 
grandmother and mother, uh, Eunice and Lois, uh, had taught you the Word of God, even as a, a Jewish uh, uh, young person. His father wasn't, uh, didn't do that. His mother and his grandmother. So, but he received the Lord as a result of uh, the teaching of the Word of God. And then, so Paul came along. He was able to lead him to the Lord uh, because of the background uh, and the Word that he had. And so that's uh, what we should realize. That, uh, but also at anger. Uh, he talks about anger here. It's like uh, the many in the Proverbs, uh, which we went through recently with a pastor, uh, Pastor Dallas Sandoval. And uh, we were looking uh, verse by verse, and the Proverbs has so many really short little messages, but here it says anger. Uh, anger can, I will tell you that uh, I thought for many years that I didn't have anger. And then I look back over my life and many times that as a Christian and was a poor testimony because I was upset because they didn't work on the computer the right way or whatever. And, and uh, so often Christians, I think, lose their temper in stores or on the highway, <laughs> uh, the way people drive. And drive, and we need to be careful to realize that our testimony is very important, and and to be patient and not to lose our temper, and to ask God to forgive, yeah, forgive us if we do, and to help us to go on to uh, live in a, a victorious way as Christians. Okay, well, our time is just about up, and so we're going to need to move quickly at the rest of this, looking at the rest of this first chapter of James. But be doers of the word, the word of God. How are you going to be a doer of the word if you don't even read it and know it? Many Christians, high, high percent, probably 90%, never read the Bible outside of going to church. Right? That's just sad. So you have to read the word first. But then to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves okay well you think you're doing all right by hearing but if you don't uh do the word of god then what good did that that do all right for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks intently as natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like but the one who looks into the perfect law, the perfect mirror, the law of liberty, and uh, perseveres, being uh, no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Okay, so we want to be doing the word of God fulfilling it every little thing that it teaches there that's the manual for life when uh, we were born god gave us a manual that goes along with us and that's the bible that's why i just love giving out the word of god knowing that we're planting the seed of the word with people and if they read it, it won't do any good if they just have it and they don't read it um and also, if they don't give it out, we give out thousands and thousands. In fact, uh, the Gideons, and I want to say a word for the Gideons here, we've given out, with the Lord's help, 2.5 billion Bibles in the world. Now, we're not the only ones giving Bibles out, so there's many other Bible organizations that are getting the Word of God out. But I just love that because... In many countries, and, the, and that's the only literature they have, they will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's the first thing that you do when you hear the Word of God is to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. But then to put into practice the things that the Word of God says. And the New Testaments that we give out have um, Psalms and Proverbs in it, which is so good. We need to go to the Psalms and the Proverbs, too. And I'm just uh, just uh, reveling in the joy of studying the Psalms more because I grew up and I didn't really spend much time in the Psalms or 
the Proverbs. And so now I'm really getting into those and just digging out gold nuggets from Psalms and the Proverbs and just loving it. Well, but it's not only to read those things, but to put them into practice. And that's what God wants us to do in our life. Well, our time is just about up, so we're going to have to finish this first chapter of the book of James. It says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, <laughs> so you've got to be careful what you say, uh, you think you're religious, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's actually, we don't want to be religious, but we want to have a relationship with Jesus. And only if we have that relationship with him, then we will be able to put into practice the things that we want to. Uh, religion can mean doing things religiously too, over and over again, the same things. Uh, but also he says in verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God. If you want to know, if you really want to be religious before God, if you really want to have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, then this is what he says. So religion um, that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows and their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So if you want to be really living for the Lord, then to help orphans, people that can't help themselves, and widows, uh, those that uh, have nothing, and to help people like that. And other places in Matthew chapter 25, it goes into uh, giving people a cup of cold water in his name and so on. And uh, Jesus, uh, when he was judging people in Matthew 25, when he judges them, actually applies to the uh, um, tribulation time, but also to us that he, he said, uh, the people were asking, well, why, why are we being judged? And he said, well, when I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was in jail, you didn't give me anything. When I was hungry, when I didn't have clothes and so on. But then he went on to the other group, why he was blessing them and rewarding them and why they were his own. They proved that they were his own by the fact that they did that. They gave. Um to the poor, to the orphans, to the widows. And uh, they went and visited those in prison and so on. That is true religion. Have a relationship with Christ and putting into practice what you believe. All right, our time is up. Actually, over time again. But with the Lord's help, uh, we'll do a better job tomorrow. So the Lord bless you and we'll see you. Let's pray. Father, just bless each and every one that's heard your word as it goes forth today. We pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Everyone who loves Jesus says, Amen. All right, we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow.